Okay. So I'll take this off. As everyone said, my name, or specifically said, my name is Gadi, and I'm here to talk to you today about honeypots. I chose a slightly different name for the presentation here than is in the agenda. Okay, I think in the agenda it was, let me see here, Gadi, everyone, cyber counterintelligence and attacker based deception approach with honey controls. So I removed the word deception, but only because I'm going to use it so much. So I figured at the title, I'll remove the main buzzword and we'll see what, happen on late, what happens later on. So right from the get-go, I would like to say this presentation is not so much technical. So if you're looking for technical information, I would suggest you leave right now. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint anyone. However, if you're looking at how to enter with a little bit of strategy, a little bit of a managerial approach using honeypots in the security space, how to enter that into the security space, um, the security management space, then this is the lecture for you. I can say that this is not yet a final product. It's a work in progress, and with that I'll dive right in. So my co-author of sorts for this, who joined me about two weeks ago, is Ranorel. He's from Israel as well. I'm from Israel. Um, I am just now left. I'm on garden leave as vice president of cybersecurity strategy at Kaspersky, a chairman of the board for the Israeli CERT. I've done other things along the way. Among those, I'm a dance teacher. I know I don't look it, <laughs> but I am. And I hope that at the end of the presentation, you'll have a lot of questions. But if you would like to ask them now, before I start, that's even better. No questions. Perfect. See, I'm already doing well. So first, a little bit of philosophy to bore you right at the very beginning. There is an inherent player advantage. The attacker, and this is an argument, you could argue either way, is stronger than the defender in cyberspace. If you look to the arena with boxing, if you look into different aspects such as military strategy throughout the history, including in this century and the centuries past, there is a very good argument the defense is stronger. The longer you get, you get to get in, uh, to your uh, objective, the more supply lines you need to maintain, there is an issue of surprise which you need to generate again and again. Defense can do this, the attacker not so much. But on the internet, as we all know, all you need is one bug. Well, on the defensive side, if you're not the researcher, if you're not the attacker, all you need is to manage your risk and see where you will put your money, your dollar worth, in order to reduce your overall risk for all these millions of millions and millions of bags across multiple systems and networks and, and architectures. So there is a mindset problem. And if we look at the attacker, number one, this is measurable, the attacker is maneuverable. It, he, she can choose where they come from, what techniques they use, how they use these techniques, when they attack, where is their objective, how they decide to get to their objective, through where. All of this on the attack side. They're also dynamic. They can test themselves. If they are developing a virus, malware, they can go and use virus total or their own homemade tools to see if it's detected or not. They have an inherent advantage. They're also very cool, at least considered very cool, highly technological, bleeding edge people. That's where the cool people want to be, the ninjas of the world. Well, I always chose the other side, as many of you have, I guess, maybe. But the defender simply looking at all of this is not. It's not as cool. There is a lot of hard work that's just repeat repetitive, day in, day out. Sometimes it's just writing a 120 pages document so that your manager cannot read it at the end. But how can we change this? How can we do a sort of major change here rather than just a little bit in this battle? So the motto here, and not sure this is just one approach, there are many others, be attacker rather than attack oriented. Let's detect the attacker the actor, the player, rather than any specific attack. So there are several methods for trying to do this. One of them is, for example, cyber threat assessments. I'm not going to go into that and how we can look at the threat as well, intelligence, the business in threat assessments rather than just regular risk assessments, how we can make them real time, more current for today. Uh, there is also the issue of cyber threat intelligence, which is the code name for anything intelligence related, useful or not. 
And I would love to talk about that, but that's a whole other lecture of what the marketplace looks like, what's being provided today, what clients actually look for depending on who they are, what they are, and all of that. What we are going to talk about is situational awareness and specifically attacker detection. Now, when usually when you discuss counterintelligence or cyber counterintelligence, it's all about personnel screening, facility hardening, asset protection policies, monitoring, all of that. And in security, sorry, in cyber nowadays, I'll just say cyber and that's it. In cyber security, online, virtually, we do the same things. We harden our machines, we patch our machines, we do um, our different network policies, and all of that. And it works. Even very advanced attackers find it really difficult to escalate within a network if you have layered defenses. So there is a lot to be said for just this basic security. Moving on from that, though, there is the cyber kill chain, which Lockheed Martin introduced. And that added a little bit of methodology to how we look at our controls beyond the normal methods of security management. It's mapping controls to different attack stages. You can use it in forensics. You can go early on to your monitoring, and it's pretty interesting. I'll go through it very quickly. Um, you've got seven stages. Reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and actions and objective. Looking at these stages, most of the controls we currently have in, in our enterprise are either at number three or number four. You can argue this point. You can say they're somewhere else. But we are lacking a lot of technologies in what we do today. We have certain gaps in what we do. Some of them in technology, some of them in methodology, some of them are in models that we lack in order to be able to do our jobs as professionals. This is just looking at controls that we have if we try to map them. Now, from the Lockheed Martin paper, you can see they tried to put some of these, um, place some of these controls into their mapping. It's kind of interesting. You can also later on look at your logs, see what, how incidents and events correlate according to these. If you haven't uh, seen the paper, I would highly recommend Googling it. It's interesting. But it wasn't enough. It gave us increased situational awareness. It gave us a model by which to manage monitoring. It gave us connecting the dots, the ability to do that between unrelated events in a new fashion. But it is still based on classic controls, on attacks. So. I would like to talk about deception, specifically as a new layer of controls. If you have had your monitoring controls and you have had your network uh, device controls and all of these different controls in your networks, I'd like to discuss in the enterprise adding another layer, which is deception control. It's highly based on honeypots or how you use honeypots. So we have basic truth that I believe to be true, hold to be true. We can't always detect individual attacks. There are new types of attacks every day, not necessarily attack types. And the, attack, the, the attacker object, objectives are discernible. If we look at who our possible attackers are, who our threat agents, threat, act, threat actors that could be interested in us are, we can likely say what they're going to be interested in in our organization. What are our crown jewels? Even if we can't tell who wants to attack us, we do know what our likely assets that we really want to protect, our critical assets are. We don't necessarily know where all the, our, da our data is, which is a process, but this is something we can think of and try to map our threats and our risks. Now, if we know where the attacker will be based on their operation, we can wait for them. We can lure them in. So there are two examples from real life, and this is where we get to the nitty gritty. Um, if you have an area you want to break into, say it's a jail, it's a store, whatever else it might be, and you see a whole lot of cameras, but there is one obvious hole in the coverage. If you walk toward that hole, that seems likely as an attacker, you'll be caught, because that's how I would build my security, the obvious and the less obvious. Another example of this is a friend of mine in, a, in his house has two safes. One is very obvious or relatively obvious. It has 100 bucks in it. It's possible the attacker will just come in, the thief will just come in, take the safe rather than open it and take the 100 bucks and go and less likely they'll go on and find the other safe hidden inside. So that's the idea of the mind shift here, what we want to do. So these are some scenarios, and I'll run them through them quickly. An APT is in your network. They're attempting to find higher privileges, escalate privileges, um, lateral movement, whatever you want to call this. What you usually, they, they're doing network scanning, basic. You can try and detect the scan or the spread, or if it's malware. What I would do in Deception is create fake computers for the scan to find. So fake IPs would pop up, perhaps with services running, 
And if somebody hits them, if somebody connects to them, boom, we caught the attacker. We can also give them a lure. I've seen this technology ages ago. This is not something new. But used in the enterprise in this particular fashion, I believe, would be interesting. Um, it's basic access control. If it hits, it's there. What's our goal? Perhaps to get the malware, perhaps just to know something happened, depending on how, how far we're willing to invest into this. Another one, an APT attempts to access your organization's crown jewels. Access control, authentication, authorization, monitoring, you can do a lot of things. For me, why not create a fake safe or a fake database? Or if we can't do that, why not double what we're already doing? For example, um, create another safe, not just a fake one. And if we can't do that, because it sounds a little bit the same, how about we create another table which shouldn't be accessed normally? So you might say, what if they are looking for what traffic goes where? We'll get there. An APT is attempting to discover an entry point to your organization by external network scanning. Firewalls, IDS, DMZ, all, all these regular tools are at your command. But why not create a fake entry point, a classic networking darknet? If it hits, it's detected. An APT is attempting to discover an entry point to your organization by accessing a current bot infection. If I had a little bit of intelligence and clear the bots I know are currently infected, if somebody comes in through this bot infection, I'll have them at the entry point. I might get their malware off of them. There is a lot I can do. I can collect intelligence on what they do, what they see, maybe RDP replay, interesting things. An APT is in your network and is trying to determine domain admin password through past the hash technology. We can do it event monitoring, we can flush the, and restart the computers. But how about creating just some, something as simple as a fake domain admin or local admin on computers? And if it's used, if it hits, something happened. Simple stuff. An attacker is mopping your network. Well, that's a little bit more extensive than simple stuff. But we can create fake nodes. We can create an entire fake network. So how do we assess these antipods? How do we, or the technologies, that we would lead to the antipods here. We have the attack stages. You can use the um, kill chain. For me, it doesn't cover what I want because the last layer, actions on objective, is what I'm looking for. So penetration, lateral movement, C2, actions on objective, data exfiltration, covering tracks. You can choose your own. And the modified OSI model of where it's happening. Physical, network, domain, host, application, data, and intelligence. So I can just put it out like this and say that the more I cover, the more areas here, the more correlations I cover, the better the antipot is. So, for example, for pass dash, it would be both on the domain and on the host, which is interesting. And in this case, it's lateral movement and actions and objective, in my view. We can argue this philosophically. Now, what could we actually do to the attacker? So, an example, if the attacker wants to spread on the network and they're trying to do port scans, they can detect them and pop up fake hosts. If they're trying, for example, to sniff the traffic, I said, I'll, I said I'll get back to this, I can create fake network traffic. They can go as low as ARP if they like, and I can create much the same in return. So we can disrupt, delay, decay, whatever it is you want to create in these, or you can go to JP313 or some other publications to see some other ideas or make up your own. Well, there is endless potential here for many Anipod technologies that already exist and many that don't, including startups and open source projects and anything else. Currently, where they are developed, and not that many places actually do, they're very local and managed by experts. But I think this could be expanded. Now, the point here is that antipods must not be treated as a technology by themselves. It's a methodology of using honeypots within the enterprise or within your network. So the idea, the core of this presentation is to push back the point of the target identification as seen by the attacker as far as possible back. Use a decoy. And this is what it looks like. We have some reconnaissance happening. It can go either way, but eventually it, they go through a point of access, they reach the internal decoy. That's the perfect scenario. They can go into host manipulation, domain manipulation, network manipulation, go back, do more discovery, more recon, whatever it is they want to do. And go through the stages of attack. Eventually, they'll have an identification of the target. What we want to do is casting, like in chess. We want to switch it up with the target, the objective, in this case, and our decoy. 
And the further back we can push this target identification, the objective to become the decoy, the better it is for us. Now, there are some considerations. Um, it could be added at the top layer on over current controls in any enterprise. It could be added just as something to cover our backs if something happens. So, for example, I have a weak authentication mechanism in my organization. Perhaps I would like some extra monitoring there. Maybe I should use some honeypots or some technology that would delay the attacker or something similar. There are several um, methodologies I put down here. Um, crown jewels, tar pits, creep wires, a lot of other things like that which you, you or we can explore. Philosophically though, deception, intelligence are just new controls for me. Some people treat them as environments, some people treat them as tools. Some people just buy and buy and buy and don't know what to do with them. But when it comes down to it, we have enough in our own networks and ability to work with our own resources to really change what an enterprise looks like today when we're trying to detect an actor on our networks. They've always been stronger, agile, dynamic, what else did I write here? Interesting. <laughs> but we've always been about set defenses, tested against. What we can do is become maneuverable, make the defense dynamic, make it interesting, and detect the attacker rather than just the attack. I don't believe every organization can actually go through with this. We're not all mature enough. I've seen some that are. But we can become mature enough. We can add this to our model of if we have done everything, what's next? For me, this is one of the answers. There are several others that I'm working on and others are working on. And also, even if we're not mature enough, some of these techniques, it doesn't have to be the whole methodology, can help us cover where, we, where we, we are basically vulnerable, or more vulnerable, or our risk is higher. Now, a last word of warning here. This should be taken with a grain of salt. I am not a lawyer, and I am not on your network. You should test this for yourselves, see if this works for you, see how it works for your architecture, for your methodology. Because one of the buzzwords I kind of skipped on when discussed is deception-oriented architecture. I didn't want to muddy the waters with buzzwords, but it sounds pretty cool. And I think, I think it does hold when you look into it. And with that, I thank you very much for your pleasure, <laughs> and I'll take any question. Yes. Can you do salsa? Can I do salsa? Yes, I can, but, but I'm not a very much of a good salsa. Dance, even though I learned for a year in university to teach I can it. teach you that. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I'm a West Coast Swing teacher. Yeah, you can teach me that. Okay. <laughs> Other questions, discussions, ideas? I'll add that some of these ideas I'm currently working with a couple of guys to try and develop in open source. But we're at early stages. We're all very busy people. If anybody would like to help, that's great. If you have ideas about the methodology, how to develop it further, where it could be actually useful for you, where you see this being useful for the world in general. I would love to hear from you. Anything else? I'll just pick people at random for questions if nobody raises their hand. No? Oh, there we go. All right, it's on? Perfect. Um, you, you added a little board. There is a notion between prevention and detection. So in the past few years, or many years, we've seen more people spending on prevention and prevention, and all those prevention me measures are failing. And now they're moving towards detection. So what you're adding to that is like deception in detection. So, but how, how do you convince like the business side of companies, organizations, on that's a better approach? Because you know, as, as technical people, we, we know it's, it's something we can try, test if it works and might be usually better because detection now is doing more than the prevention we, we were hoping for. So how do you tackle this? Okay, for me, your question is larger and I'll try to be very brief because we don't have all day. <laughs> um, the job, there are many jobs, many responsibilities for the CSO in the company. The main one is money. Can you get the money, can you get in nicer words, the budget to do what you need to do? For that, you need to be very, very business oriented. 
What we're used to doing in security, many of us, me included, in some occasions, or I try very hard not to do this, is FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. How can we scare people to get what we want? Because it's very, very hard for us, in any measurable way, to measure security, to show the business how security is a part of it. And then either we succeed and we get more money or we don't. And either something happens and we are successful or we aren't, depending on the chain of events. We gave you money. Why did this happen? We gave you mo not money. Nothing happened. Same thing. So for me, it's about how do you get money to do what you need to do to make your risk posture better a quarter from now, a year from now, measurable. And this is just another technique. Why do you need a firewall? Why do you need anything else? If you're asking about budget points, the organizations already know how to buy a firewall, not necessarily how to buy or implement honeypot methodology. But if you look at your risk models, and this is getting a little bit buzzwordy, putting this in there in, with intelligence and with threats uh, intelligence and with all of these other calculations to make it more real time just makes sense. It's about security methodology. It's not about the business. The business side is where you use this to get the money you need, in my view. Anything else? Then in that case, thank you very much. Oh, yes, another one there. Yay. <laughs> Um, when I think of uh, setting up a fake network or fake systems to distract attackers, um, I'm thinking of an activity that uh, would make up my whole day of work. I mean, it's, it's intense uh, to put up something, to monitor something. I believe it's not a technical issue, but it's the issue of finding the people that will set up and operate such a fake network. So uh, how would you optimize this so it can be really possible with the least... Uh, I don't know, time-wise effect to make this possible. Okay. First of all, there are a few tricks here that we all know how to do. Creating this sort of, let's call it a honeypot for a second, honey token, whatever you want to call this, of pass the hash is relatively simple. It's relatively simple. It shouldn't take you much time. There are things you can do on your own. But if the organization decides in their overall risk posture that they have a problem in a certain place, how are we going to cover this? Do we use this uh, model? Do we use that model? Do we add another firewall? Do we put some deception in there? That should come into the security considerations. And if that's decided, that's what will be, will be implemented. Now, to say, for example, that tomorrow a startup won't come up and say, we want to prevent lateral movement. So we're going to look at past the hash through the, through the domain and through the host. We're going to look for scans on the network and pop up fake hosts. We're going to even, say, create fake traffic, even ARP traffic, to make sure that when um, an attacker comes in and tries to sniff the traffic and see where to go, they hit something that doesn't exist. But all of this should be implemented just like any other thing in security. If you're looking for budget to create it on your own, such as some large organizations today that are already very mature do, that's great. Otherwise, it's a business decision. So your question is basically the opposite of what was asked before. I hope I answered. If not, we'll talk about this more later. Anything else? Yeah. Then thank you very much again. And have a good day.